Hey everybody, welcome to Crazy Tech Lab and I've got an awesome video for you today because yesterday I spent the day trawling through a whole lot of information that was sent over from AMD in advance of the talk by Lisa Sue at the Virtual Computex event this week and uh, you probably may have seen that already but if you haven't I've got a whole load more information that you'll be interested in talking about and discussing um, here today on the video and I'll be doing some discussion into the technical details of the new Ryzen 7000 series so I cover all the uh, I've covered all the launches all the way back to the first generation Ryzen um, both here on the channel and also on my account over on Forbes as well which you can see uh, some of the slides that were presented today and maybe some extra stuff um, as well uh, based on the technical information that I was passed over yesterday from AMD. So I'm recording this at the moment, uh, not having known what uh, Lisa Sue uh, specifically is going to say tomorrow. Um, I think there is a uh, kind of pre-recording available here, but I've just been looking at the one from the AMD uh, tech guys, specifically Robert Halleck, and uh, talking through some of the details there. So today uh, what we're doing just is, as I mentioned, just going through some of the technical details and working out what AM5 is, what Ryzen 7000 is, what the new CPUs will have in terms of features. There's a whole bunch of new stuff, uh, probably this most significant Ryzen launch for quite a while, and uh, working out whether it is for you, maybe whether you should wait to upgrade to Ryzen, 7, uh, Ryzen 7000 if you're considering buying new at the moment. To start with though, the, uh, the launch dates for the Ryzen 7000 series and also the new AMD motherboards sporting new chipsets will be in fall this year. So autumn this year we can expect the new CPUs and new motherboards to land. So we have a little while yet, it's uh, only May at the moment, so we have a few months to uh, sift through all the information. There will probably be performance leaks and all that kind of stuff, much more discussion to come, but today it's all about the information that we've been given today, so let's crack on. So to start with then, there are some significant performance advantages coming with Zen 4, and we will be going through them one by one and looking at the impact that they might have on the performance that we can expect in both content creation and games. So to start with then, there is a, a one megabyte per core L2 cache. So that's twice the amount of cache that we've seen before. And as we know, cache basically means lower latencies. It's why AMD introduced the 3D vCache on top of the uh, existing cache on the Ryzen 7 5800X3D. That's why that CPU is so fast in games because uh, AMD has struggled with latency in the past and that's one of the reasons why first gen Ryzen was nowhere near Intel in terms of gaming, but AMD has got progressively faster with the uh, with gaming performance thanks to lower and lower latencies culminating with the Ryzen 7 5800X3D which is pretty much the most powerful overall uh, processor for games right now. So extra L2 cache per core is definitely going to lower latencies further still with Zen 4. Uh, the next one, the performance figure we've been given is greater than 15% single thread uplift. So that is a significant performance increase. And uh, you know, 50 uh, the single thread performance is always an indicator of general performance as well. It's it's very very good at a, a very very good indicator of general performance, probably in multi-threading multi-threaded workloads as well. A 15% uplift is a huge amount. Uh, and that's basically made up of an increase in IPC, which is essentially how efficient and how powerful and fast a core is. But also, uh, obviously, frequency uh, multiplies that. So the max boost frequency is going to be above 5 gigahertz with Zen 4, and that's obviously significant as well, because all everything else being equal, we will be seeing higher frequencies than we did with Zen 3, and that is going to increase performance, but we're also seeing uh, the increase in L2 cache and uh, other tweaks. You know, we've got a brand new architecture here, so everything is going to be faster, hopefully more efficient as well, and uh, leading to that 15% and uh, an above increase in single thread performance. So 
Moving on, and uh, the next slide was perhaps even more interesting because we are obviously confirming that Zen 4 will be 5 nanometers, and this is essentially referring to the core chiplets. So there are two core chiplets, um, eight cores each, as far as we know at the moment, and uh, they are going to be 5 nanometers, as I've already mentioned. But the key feature here, something that's really, really interesting, is a brand new... Uh, architecture in the IO die which is now six nanometers and uh, going to be much much lower power than the IO die in previous generations of uh, Ryzen I believe it was introduced in either in the Ryzen 3000 is that when the IO die was introduced I think that's when it was but what we've got now is a low power 16 nanometer sorry six nanometer IO die and critically for the first time AMD is adding radeon RDNA 2 graphics to all of its CPUs. So just like Intel does with its K-series CPUs and the vast majority of them, uh, other than the KF versions, which are a bit cheaper, that lack integrated graphics, AMD is going the same way as Intel and it is introducing integrated graphics onto all of its Ryzen CPUs. So this essentially means that you will not need a discrete graphics card to run a Ryzen processor. So we already had AMD's APUs, such as the Ryzen uh, the 3400G and those kind of things, but this time the, you will not be needing a discrete graphics card to run your Ryzen CPU. So if you just want to tap into the power of Zen for uh, other tasks and you don't need a discrete graphics card for whatever reason, then you will be able to do that. And the new motherboards will support HDMI 2.0 and DisplayPort 2. Uh, that's what AMD is uh, stating at the moment for those that care about those features. So we also know that AM4, uh, AM4 and socket AM5 are going to be DDR5 and that's pretty much exclusive. It doesn't look like at the moment there are any plans for AMD to offer DDR4 support in addition to DDR5 like Intel has done. Um, and I think Intel was probably pretty wise in doing that because it means that at the lower end, uh, you didn't have to spend a fortune on DDR5 memory and you could uh, you know, transplant your older DDR4 memory and it just meant that if you were in the lower half of the, uh, the budget and price range uh, if you were looking for a new PC, that was a pretty good deal. So AM, uh, AMD socket AM5 and Zen 4 though will be DDR5 only um, as far as we can see at the moment. We will also be getting PCI Express 5.0. Now the extent now the extent to which PCIe 5.0 is included depends on the chipset. So there are three key chipsets, uh, three key chipsets that AMD is going to be introducing, and the first one, the flagship chipset, which is going to be uh, the high end, highest end premium motherboards, is going to be X670 Extreme. Now this has PCI, uh, PCI Express 5.0 everywhere. So storage, CPU, graphics, it's across the whole motherboard. So if you want to dip down a little bit and just have PCIe 5.0 uh, on the storage and graphics, so fewer PCIe 5.0 lanes, uh, just for storage, uh, there are PCI Express 5.0 SSDs uh, in the pipeline with, AM, uh, with uh, some of AMD's partners. Um, as well as PCIe 5.0 graphics, then the cheaper X670 standard chipset is what you will want to go for. And there will still be some very, very high-end motherboards there with all the key features except slightly less PCI Express 5.0 support. Next is B650, and that includes most of the features, probably slightly lower-end motherboards as we've seen in the past, and PCI Express 5.0 just on the storage so you don't get PCIe 5.0 in on the graphics or anywhere else on the motherboard it's just on the storage so you can run those super fast SSDs which you may or may not care about I mean most of us are perfectly happy with the uh, sort of 7000 megabytes a second uh, sustained read speeds um, in PCI Express 4.0 but you'll be looking at stuff that's significantly faster than that. Uh, AMD I think was quoting 60% faster than PCI Express 4.0 with PCI Express 5.0 so whether or not you need that speed is very much going to depend on your particular needs. 
Another really important feature is that Socket AM4 coolers will be compatible with Socket AM5, so you will not need to buy a new heatsink or AIO liquid cooler or uh, change your water block if you're, if you're doing custom liquid cooling. You will not need to buy any adapters or have different mounting kits as far as we know for Socket AM5 and Ryzen 7000, unlike Intel's Alder Lake CPUs, which obviously had that slightly lower Z height the heat spreader sat slightly low, which meant that quite a few coolers out there didn't end up applying the right pressure and you could end up with higher temperatures as a result. That doesn't seem to be the case with Socket AM5. So whatever cooler you've got now cooling your Socket AM4 system, you will be able to transplant into your new Socket AM5 system. So that's pretty good news for us as consumers. Sometimes it's nice to have a bit of a refresh and uh, get uh, manufacturers you know producing new coolers um, it can result in better performance sometimes but I guess for a um, uh, for the value perspective and the ability to transplant your existing coolers and have all the high-end coolers that are out there at the moment being compatible with socket am5 it's probably the better way round of the two so thankfully no need to upgrade or uh have to get an adapter for your cooler which is uh, which is really good news amd obviously moving to a uh, lga socket so there are pins in the socket just like in an intel socket so the cpu will not have any of the pins that have been on there in the past with ryzen uh, cpus and uh, amd's processors before that I'm kind of in two minds about this. I mean, I can appreciate that it's a, a much more elegant design and uh, you'll, you'll hopefully not be bending the pins on the CPU, but those socket pins are extremely fragile and we are... I've I Personally, I've killed way more motherboards than I have uh, way more uh, pinned motherboards, uh, LGA motherboards, than I have uh, Ryzen CPUs because it's pretty easy to bend the pins on a Ryzen CPU back. In fact, you can drop it several times and bend the pins back the right way. Obviously, I do not recommend you do that. I mean, you know, I deal, I've dealt with dozens of Ryzen CPUs over the years. Occasionally, I have an accident because um, I'm constantly pulling them in and out of sockets, benchmarking. Um, so yeah, you're just going to have to make sure that you are super, super careful and don't bend those pins in the socket because they are incredibly fragile, very, very difficult to repair. It's, it's not impossible depending on how much you've bent them, but you just need to be very, very, very careful when you place the CPU into the socket and keep whatever socket cap AMD provides, I'm assuming it will do because Intel does, uh, keep that cap on the motherboard at all times when there is not a CPU in the socket. Just my, just my two cents there. So also there is native support for up to 170 watts in the socket. So that's obviously significantly higher than we've seen before. And that is probably tying in with the far higher boost frequencies but AMD specifically said in the press briefing that we had yesterday that it was also going to allow for much higher multi-threaded performance so for example we've seen um, much much lower boosting frequencies in multi-threaded tests with certain CPUs the uh, Ryzen, uh, Ryzen 9 5950X for example I think it clocked back all the way from like 4.9 with its peak boost which you'd see on maybe one or two cores all the way back to 4 or 4.1 gigahertz, I think it was, when all cores were engaged, simply because it had to stay within that 105 watt envelope. But now we're seeing much, much higher power being provided through the socket. That will probably mean higher power consumption for systems that are, you know, really pushing things, but it will also mean much more performance. So we're maybe not looking at a very power frugal uh, lineup of uh, AMD CPUs here. Obviously, I can't really say much more than that and that's maybe even uh, you know just kind of figuring out where we are and that might not even turn out to be the case but there is more power available to the processor socket so there's every chance that we might see some hotter running more power hungry processors but equally we might see significantly more performance because of that especially in multi-threaded workloads where those power consumption figures typically peak so that is pretty much it today so i will be obviously covering all this news on this channel and on my forbes channel um, over the next few months before the launch i will hopefully be taking a look at the new cpus when they are launched as well and it's very very exciting times because we're expecting new cpus from intel 
uh, either later this year or early next year, depending on how things go. So the CPU wars, you know, they really hotted up back in 2017. They've been getting progressively more interesting and more dynamic and we've now got a very kind of quite different approaches from intel and amd so it's really really exciting times and these processor wars certainly do not look like they are slowing down at all so don't forget to like comment and subscribe on this video love hearing what you guys think about uh current pc hardware and also drop in your comments below about what you think of AMD's new Ryzen CPUs as well. And if you want to see a written version of this uh, preview of AMD's new architecture and join in the discussion, you can tune into my article over on Forbes using the link below, um, or of course, chime in on the comments. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you soon.